I want to return to talking about the skeptical solution that Kripke attributes to Wittgenstein. It's not maybe exactly Wittgenstein's <laughs> solution, though maybe it is. Maybe Kripke is getting Wittgenstein right. Certainly it's expressed in a way that is a bit more direct than Wittgenstein expresses it. But I want to think more about just what that solution amounts to and go through some of what Kripke says. Um, and maybe we can start by putting it in a certain perspective. So let me go way back, <laughs> back before Wittgenstein, back before the analytic tradition that we've talked about here, all the way to Plato's Theotetus. The Theotetus is a dialogue about knowledge. The question is really, what is knowledge? And there are a number of proposals that are made in the dialogue. One of them is knowledge is perception. In other words, knowledge is just how things appear to you. And that gets rejected. Uh, there is a complicated argument against the kind of relativism that it implies, but there's also, in a way, a really simple point. Suppose somebody says, what is it to know something? And you say, ah, just however it seems to you, you know that. How might you reply? Circular. So why circular? Because you just said, you know, what is it to know something? It's to know something. You're not really getting anywhere. Well, yeah, so let's see. How should I really frame it to avoid that circularity? Just say, to know something is to have it seem to you to be a certain way. So the wall looks green to you, you know it's green. Yeah? If knowledge is true belief and it's, things seem differently to different people, it would produce contradictions in the world? Ooh, okay. We ordinarily think knowledge implies truth, right? And so, indeed, if it just seems, the, if, it, if the walls seem green to me and seem gray to you, but definitely not green to you, then it looks like you know they're not green and I know they are green. And that seems already kind of disturbing. But then if we supplement that with the thought that, wait a minute, you can't know something unless it's true, then we've got the walls are both green and not green. And that seems bad. And so it, that's a very simple reason for thinking, wait, it can't just be a question of how it seems to you. That makes the difference between appearance and reality just go away. And it makes the difference between opinion and knowledge go away. Um, and so that seems wrong. Now, what could we say beyond that? Well, we could say, okay, what if it's, yeah, it's actually, you've given us the key, it's true belief. Knowledge is true belief. What's wrong with that? Suppose you have an opinion. You're right. Can we say you know it? Well, at the very least, it needs to be justified. Good, it needs to be justified, right? Suppose you have an utterly unjustified belief. You're just guessing, and so you believe it, um, and it turns out you're guessing correctly. But on the other hand, you don't have any justification. Um, I, I say to one of you, who's going to win the Super Bowl next year? And you say... Patriots. Patriots, okay. Yeah. Um, do you have a justification? Now, yeah, probably you do in this case. <laughs> However, suppose you don't know much about football. You just say, uh, I don't know, what teams have I even heard of? Jaguars. The Jaguars, <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, I would be in this position with certain sports um, where it's like, yeah, I don't know. Can I even think of the name of a team in that sport? Um, I have a couple of friends who follow British soccer uh, very closely. You know, and, and I, don't, I, I know the name of Manchester United. But that's like it. That's all I know. And so if somebody says, who's going to win? I would say, Manchester United. Do I have a justification? It's the only team I've heard of. It's the only thing I can tell you. Now, that's, of course, just saying something. That's different from a belief. But suppose I actually do form the belief in that way. Or actually, Plato's case involves something that's actually ha having a reason, but having the totally wrong sort of reason. So his example is this. A judge forms the belief that the defendant in a criminal case is guilty on the basis of some kind of bias. Okay, the judge is notices something about the defendant he doesn't like, whatever that is, and thinks, eh, that kind of guy, I don't like people like that, he's guilty. And it turns out the judge is right that the guy is guilty, but it's purely on the basis of this bias. It's not on the basis of the evidence. Would we say the judge knows the defendant is guilty? No. So we need a justification. You've got to have a reason for your belief, even if it is true, and that reason has to be a good reason. It has to be legitimate in some way. Now, at the end of the Theotetus, 
we don't just get left with this justification or this definition of knowledge as justified true belief. Instead, Plato lays out a sort of puzzle for this view. And it goes like this. Well, we can have this belief that turns out to be knowledge because it's justified in terms of these other beliefs. And that might be justified in terms of these other beliefs. But presumably, this chain of justification or reasons doesn't go on forever. At some point, it has to stop. And in the end, what do we have then? It looks like this all has to rest on some foundation of basic beliefs. And we've drawn this sort of layer cake view a number of times. Um, at the bottom of that, it looks like, well, we've got some things that are knowledge, right? On the other hand, because things known must rest on things, other things that are known. But at the bottom level, there can't be any justification. And so Plato leaves us with this puzzle. How could knowledge be justified true belief if, in the end, all of knowledge is going to rest on some foundation of things that are known and yet not justified? And there are various options for getting around this. One, foundationalism that we've talked about says, well, they justify themselves. One, coherentism says, the whole picture is wrong. It's just a question of some things justifying other things, and there is no basic level. And then you could also think this leads us down to a level of things that are no longer beliefs. Um, they're sensations, they're something of a different kind. And so they do serve as justifiers, but they don't stand in need of any justification. Now, the reason I go through that, and we've talked about the general picture a number of times here, especially in connection with logical empiricism, but the reason I mention it now is that something like this is going on with respect to rules and with respect to interpretation. Yeah. Did you mention those three solutions again? Yeah, sure. Um, let's see. <laughs> OK. We have this picture of knowledge as consisting of the layer cakes, where there's a justification in terms of things at more basic levels. But at some point, we reach this basic level. We've referred to it in the past as the given. But then the problem seems to be that if knowledge is justified true belief, the worry is this is known. But on the other hand, it seems to be not justified. It's the most basic level. And so what do we say about that? That looks like that refutes the claim that knowledge is justified true belief, that knowledge requires justification. And so our three options are, first of all, foundationalism. And that's the view that basically the given justifies itself. So that's option one. Option two is known as coherentism. And that says the whole picture is wrong, that we have something much more like a web of belief, where things are justifying other things within this web, but there is no level of ultimate justifiers. And then three is often called direct realism. And it's the view that, well, what we get, <laughs> so yeah, this is option two. Option three is that this level of given things is not a level that consists of belief. It instead consists of sensations or something like that. And so we don't have beliefs that could be true and are not justified. We get something like sensations that couldn't be true or false. And they serve as justifiers without being justified and make the rest of it work. So any of those three might be options for us. Now, how does any of that apply to Wittgenstein? Well, the idea is really this. If I'm thinking about what to do in addition, for example, what am I really doing? I am maybe applying rules I learned in school. Maybe I'm just doing things pretty automatically. A huge amount of what we do actually depends on having certain things be automatic. Um, in fact, there are certain trends in education that I'm very suspicious of that tend to say, well, um, memorizing things is a waste of time. Don't bother doing it. Um, the reason I think that's wrong is that a lot of things have to be automatic. If somebody says, look, you don't need to actually memorize the multiplication tables, you know, just, just figure it out in each case. You see 7 times 8, and you think, oh, well, uh, let me see. That's like 7, 14, 21, you know. <laughs> just figure it out in every case. You're never going to go very far in arithmetic, right? Just figuring everything out from the basics every time. Certain things have to be automatic. And so the idea in the Wittgensteinian application of this is that at certain levels, things are just automatic. So let's say we're trying to understand what we mean by plus. Maybe we do it in terms of an algorithm. Maybe we do it in terms of a recursive definition, uh, or whatever it is. But eventually, we get to a point where we just take things for granted. And we just think we know what's going on there. We just 
go with our intuitions um, or our automatic, uh, you might say, reactions. So in short, Kripke says, Wittgenstein thinks there's a level, sort of like this level now, but here with respect to rule following rather than looking for justifications exactly, where I respond to things unhesitatingly but without justification. And he says, in these cases, I cannot be said <laughs> to be acting wrongfully. There's a sort of pun in the German here that's hard to represent in English. Um, the word for justification basically means something like right-making. And so there is no, nothing that makes it right for me to respond in this way, and yet it is not not right. <laughs> So I'm not not right, but on the other hand, I am not. There's nothing making it right. I'm just responding that way, okay? And so in short, I just do what I'm inclined to do. And the point is that at that level, <coughs> at least if I'm thinking about my own behavior, that's all I can do. I just follow my own confident inclinations. And so we can talk about Confidence is the key here. And in fact, at one point he says, look, it's a question of being confident that I know how to go on. And so here, there really is a level uh, where this is becomes something very much like this. It's a question of knowing how to go on, how to do the next arithmetic problem. Yeah? How is it different than foundationalism? Um, well, it really is very much like foundationalism. It's in a sense saying there is some basic level where I just do what I do, right? What I'm inclined to do. Uh, as long as I have a feeling of confidence that I feel as if I'm applying a rule. And so one of the key questions here is under what circumstances can we attribute meaning? And so the way Kripke puts it is this. Suppose we've got Jones. And Jones, <laughs> the, yeah, the claim is this. Jones means plus by that symbol. And we're trying to figure out the assertability conditions for that. Remember, that's not going to get truth condi conditions. We're going to throw away the tractarian model of language. Instead, we ask, under what conditions is that assertable? And now, it really becomes two questions. Under what conditions is it assertable for Jones? And then, under what conditions is it assertable for Smith? So under what conditions can Jones say, I mean plus by the additional sum? <laughs> the answer is this. It just goes with his confident inclinations. Okay? Now, <laughs> maybe this explains why some of you have fallen behind on homework. You don't have confident inclinations. I say, what did Kwai mean by blah, blah, blah? And you think, eh, I don't know. Uh, and that means you lack those confident inclinations. So indeed, if Jones is a small child and you say, so, so little Jones there, do you think you've mastered addition? Uh, do you think you can do the next problem? And poor little Jones goes, mm, I don't know, I don't really get it. Then, indeed, Jones can't attribute meaning plus by that symbol to himself. And so we look for that confidence um, and that ability to have these unhesitating inclinations. Unhesitating in the sense that, you know, I say, what's three plus four? Seven. Seven, right? He didn't hesitate. He didn't think, oh, three plus four. Man, it's been a long time. I don't know. <laughs> right? Whereas if I suddenly say, okay, um, who's the greatest philosopher of the 19th century? Fine. Quine, Quine was in the 19th century. Wait, see? All right, now that brings us to Smith, okay? <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, you might say, well, gosh, I don't know. In which case, you know, there's, uh, <laughs> there's not that confident inclination. But now we go to Smith and say, ah, under what circumstances does Smith say Jones means plus five, plus? Okay, so we've got the child, and when does the child say, yeah, I got it? I got, I, I've got the concept of addition. It's when they've got that confidence that they know how to go on. But let's say Smith is the teacher. When does the teacher say, 
little Jones here, has the concept of addition. Does mean plus by that symbol. When Jones gets all the problems right? Yeah, yeah. Well, now, does Jones have to get all the problems right? Just enough to show that they know. Yeah, enough of the problems right, okay? So, it's not as if the teacher stands there and says, only one of you got 100 on our arithmetic test. That person means plus <laughs> by that symbol. <laughs> However, the rest of you, <laughs> right? Um, the rest of you may be insane and for all I know, you're going to answer five. Um, no, you've got to get enough. So there has to be enough agreement. Agreement with whom? Well, with Smith. <laughs> right? Smith has to say, yeah, that's the answer I would get. Enough of the time. And now what about the cases where there's something that goes wrong? There could be errors. We don't require that... Jones get 100 on the test. But when there is a mistake, what kind of mistake does it have to be? There's a kind of mistake that would let somebody say, you're trying to do addition. You're just doing it wrong. <laughs> and there's a kind of mistake that would say, uh, wait, I take this as evidence that you don't even mean addition by this. You're doing something else. So what kind of mistake would give you that latter? It could be systematic, like if you wrote repetitively keep making the same mistake that leads you to the wrong answer. That would show that you're consistently using like a different whatever for plus. Ah, so one thing is, yeah, we can find consistent errors so that every time you have to carry the one or whatever in doing an addition problem, you screw that up somehow. And we might say, yeah, you don't have the concept because you don't have the right algorithm. You carry the one and then you do something wacky with it. Um, maybe you just insert it. So you're thinking, what is 15 plus 27? And you say, okay, that's 12. Carry the 1, put it over here. That's 3, so the answer is 132. We'd say, yeah, you don't have a concept, right? That's the wrong algorithm. So you're right. One thing is there could be a kind of systematic using the wrong algorithm. Is there anything else that would make us say, you don't have the right concept? The number got smaller instead of larger. Okay, yeah, 15 plus 27, and you say, oh, the answer is 2. And maybe you're like Kripke skeptic, where you say, I'm, I'm sorry, any time it goes over 10, the answer is just 2. And, you know, the teacher says, no, 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 we can add numbers so that we can get 11, 12. No, no, just 2. <laughs> I refuse to go over 10. I mean, God gave me 10 fingers for a reason. That's all I'm supposed to do. Anything beyond that, just 2. Why two? Because I have two hands. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that would be a view, right? But that's not addition. I don't know what that is. And so we end up saying, yeah, the errors have to be the kind of errors that we could call mistakes in calculation. Not doing a different kind of calculation, not bizarre errors. So they, I'll just put it this way. They have to not be bizarre. <laughs> and I, that, that's the way Kripke puts it. But I think you're also right to say they can't be systematic in a way that indicates you're just using the totally wrong algorithm. Um, that sometimes you forget to carry the one or whatever, that we can tolerate. But you consistently do a radically wrong thing. So that, that, that would be unacceptable. So they're not bizarre and they're not systematic um, in that sort of wrong <laughs> algorithm way where it's not that you're trying but sometimes failing to implement the right algorithm. You're just using the wrong algorithm altogether. Okay, so there's got to be enough agreement, and the errors have to be ones you can explain in terms of somebody trying to actually implement that meaning, but failing to do it. And indeed, people do fail in this way all the time. A good example is actually in Bogosian's paper, where he talks about the concept of horse, and it may be that you misidentify. Um, certain animals as horses when they're not really horses. Maybe in the dark you see a cow and you think it's a horse. Or actually, I had an encounter like that this weekend. Um, my daughter lives in a house in a neighborhood that's really just on the edge of farm country. And so she can walk to corn fields and cotton fields and hay fields. And, and there is in particular a view from her window of this farm in the distance. And I thought, yeah, there are a bunch of horses on the farm. And I thought they were all horses. Well, 
I actually took a walk over there and got up to the fence, and they're mostly horses, but there is one donkey. A curious donkey who had evidently never seen a philosopher before came over to the fence to examine this philosopher more closely. Uh, yeah, I'm attributing the concept of a philosopher to a donkey. This is supposed to be funny. Uh, in any event, um, I had always mistaken that donkey for a horse from a distance when it, you know, it was very small off at the horizon, but all of a sudden I get up close and I realize, yeah, that's... Uh, and so that's the kind of area that you think, all right, it's not that Bonovac means now horse or donkey by horse. <laughs> it's just an error of a kind we can understand on the basis of somebody trying to apply that concept. Okay, so this is the sort of picture that Wittgenstein, at least on Kripke's view, is developing. Instead of saying a statement about meanings like this is trying to state a fact, we say, no, we have to understand it as a move in a kind of language game. And what's the utility of the move? Um, well, here we've described the conditions under which it might be made, the assertability conditions. Jones gets to assert it when Jones feels a kind of confidence and has a sort of immediate in inclination to respond in certain ways. And then Smith attributes it to Jones when Jones responds in a way that agrees enough the time with Smith, that agrees and disagrees when it does disagree in the right sort of way that Smith can understand and explain. So what's the utility of the whole game now? What's the point of our doing addition? Well, Kripke talks about this in terms of going to the grocer and asking for five apples. But presumably, we count things all the time, right? Numbers turn out to be useful for all sorts of things. And so we say, look, it's just useful for us to have a system whereby we do this. Now, in doing that, in setting it up, notice I'm not saying under what circumstances does 57 plus 68 equal 125. I'm not asking for the fact that underlies that. I'm just saying there's this social practice. And as long as there's enough agreement in the social practice, things work out. Now, some things have to be the case for such a social practice to exist. And so one of those things is agreement. People have to pretty much in the community <coughs> agree about what sums are. Suppose there's a lot of disagreement. Suppose you say, what's one plus one? And some people say two, but others, the dissidents, say three. Um, then you've got a problem. Right. <laughs> and then Smith might be, if he's one of the three camps, say, Jones, ah, you don't have a concept. Um, you add one plus one and get two. Whereas Jones can say, well, no, Smith, you're the one who doesn't have the concept. You're the one who adds one plus one gets three. And so we've got to suppose that the community agrees enough that this practice, this form of life, as Wittgenstein puts it, can actually take place. Now, there might be some edges where we disagree or get different answers and so on. We hope that in those cases we have ways of sorting it out and figuring out who's right. But there's got to be a basis of agreement. So sometimes this is going to work out nicely, as, for example, in arithmetic. There is this basis of agreement. But there are going to be other circumstances where actually there's a lot of disagreement, right? And even on the most fundamental things, people just have different confident inclinations. And there isn't very much agreement. And so that makes it very difficult for us to assess whether these people mean the same thing as we do by certain terms. So what are some areas where that kind of basic level of agreement in society is going to fall apart and we won't be able to rely on it? Does God exist? Okay, good. Religion. Does God exist? If so, what is God like? There isn't much agreement about that. And so you might think that's a place where we don't really have the kind of agreement that can lead to a shared form of life. Now, within a given religious tradition, there might be. And so there might be a form of life that Buddhists, for example, can share, um, or that Christians can share, or that Muslims can share. But then if we say, ah, but get away from uh, that and look for something broader, is there something we can all agree about and take as fundamental? Maybe the answer is no. In which case, you might say that Smith can look at Jones's confident inclination and not say, oh, yes, I approve you as using the same concept as I do, but in fact, well, what would happen if there's this kind of fundamental disagreement about certain things? Jones is confidently inclined to assert all sorts of things about God. And Smith, let's say, is an atheist. What is Smith going to say? Now, really, there are two questions here. What on this picture should Smith say? <laughs> and then what would Smith really say? 
And I don't think either one is very easy to answer here. On this picture, what should Smith say? Well, ideally, looking at Jones saying, do you mean, well, first of all, there's going to be a problem, right? Because if Smith doesn't believe in God, then what, what is Smith going to attribute to Jones? Uh, uh, you know, it's, anyway, it gets weird. It's hard to tell at this level what's a difference in meaning and what's a difference um, about facts given shared meanings. So that's going to be a, a sort of open question. And also, Smith might say, you know, I don't know what you mean. I don't know what you're talking about. Or Smith might say, I know what you mean, but I think you're wrong about the facts. But then there could be all sorts of things in between. And so an issue like this comes up, actually, occasionally when people ask the question, um, do Muslims and Christians worship the same God, for example? Or you can ask the same thing. Do Hindus and Taoists, let's say, have the same conception of this underlying un unity in the world? And it's very hard to answer those questions in a certain sense. Um, partly, it might depend on the theory of proper names and stuff like that you have. But partly, it's going to be difficult because of this kind of question. Um, it's going to be, in a sense, attributing meanings depends on a certain shared form of life that might not exist. And in that case, it's hard to say whether that person means something different or means the same thing you do, but just has different beliefs about that thing. Um, the other thing that has to be the case for this to work out in the way that Wittgenstein has in mind is that there has to be a kind of checkability, <laughs> an inspectability, if you will, to this. So I have to be able to see actually what you're doing. For example, how does the teacher find out whether little Jones is mastering it? Grades the paper. That's right, grades the paper, maybe gives a test. Or just ask a question in class, right? I've, I've noticed that in certain kinds of classes, at least, I can tell who understands things before I ever get a homework or ever receive a paper or um, look at the results of an exam and so on. Now, occasionally, I'm surprised because there are lots of really bright students who don't say much. On the other hand, it's very rare that somebody actually says a lot of good things in class and then writes a terrible exam. <laughs> Though it is not unknown, I can think of a case. And it... For, it produced a crisis in our graduate program, actually. We used to give these history exams that people had to pass to qualify for the PhD. And we had a terrific student, wonderful student, who did very well on everything, except he could not pass these exams. Okay, did terribly in these exams. Couldn't write a coherent essay, uh, given a time constraint. Say, you know, write a paper by the end of the term. Brilliant. Write something about the connection between Locke and Hume in the next hour. Wow. Disaster, okay? And so we had to figure out what to do with this guy. What do you do? Do you throw him out and say, listen, you can't progress to the PhD? Do you say, well, we keep our requirement in place, but we make an exception for this guy because he's really good? <laughs> or do you just get rid of the requirement? Um, what would you do, by the way? Get rid of the requirement. Good, good answer. That was my answer. A lot of people wanted to make an exception for him. That was actually the proposal on the table. I said, you can't do that. You can't say, well, look, the following things are required, unless you're really smart and we like you, in which case <laughs> you don't have to do it. I mean, if he doesn't have to do it, nobody should have to do it. So we got rid of the exams. Um, and I suppose a critic might say, yes, and that in a nutshell is the story of American education. <laughs> but in the event, uh, yeah, we think these things are checkable. Now, notice in cases like that, we do allow for the possibility that they're not, that your understanding is not going to be checked in the right way. It might be, for example, that Little Jones can answer any addition question you give, as long as you don't make him write it down. But the moment he has to look at it and in writing, he freaks out. Or it could be like that, that student in the PhD program. As long as the person is talking or has unlimited time to write the paper, no problem. But suddenly say, you know, here's a timed essay exam, boom, can't do it. And so sometimes, the checks we have. Sort of like here, there can be errors. So here, there can be certain kinds of checks that a person fails. But the idea has to be, well, we can understand why the person is failing there. Um, and so, in principle, this must be something where we can tell. Notice what's going on with Jones. Jones, in a sense, is just proceeding by confident inclination. So Jones can very easily say, I mean this by that. And in a sense, that's cheap. There's no way of really checking that unless Smith 
from the outside can say, well, do I agree with that? I've got to be able to check what this person is actually, I've got to look at some be bit of behavior, you might say, a behavioral manifestation of what's going on here, and then indicate whether that is something that I would approve as, um, as actually coming up with the right answer on the arithmetic test or whatever. <clears throat> and so in principle, this has to be something someone else can check and say, do I agree with that or not? Otherwise, and this is the key to what is known as Wittgenstein's private language argument, otherwise, we've just got this confident inclination. And it's as if we were back in Plato and we're at the level of the definition of knowledge is just whatever appears to you. Knowledge is perception. It's like, hey, what is it to mean something? Just to feel some confidence. And that doesn't mean, and especially since this is associated by both Wittgenstein and Kripke with concept mastery, we don't say, well, confidence gives you mastery of the concept. In fact, there's something called the Dunning-Kruger effect. Have you heard of this? Basically, yeah, the, the less you know, the more confident you are of your knowledge, roughly speaking. So if you look at people and judge their com competence on some kind of test, and then you judge their confidence, there tends to be this weird relationship. Now, if somebody really knows nothing, they are inclined to you know, have no competence and no confidence. But it's actually the people who have a little bit of competence who have the most confidence. And then the more you learn about the subject, you, the more you become aware that you don't know and don't understand. And so, basically, the curve of confidence to, con to you know, knowledge goes like that. So the expert will often say, well, I don't know, it's complicated, blah, blah, blah. Whereas the person who's a relative beginner will say, oh, I got it, I understand it all. Um, hence the term sophomore, a wise fool, the person who actually you know, thinks they understand it but don't yet. Uh, no offense to those who might be sophomores of the group. Uh, but that's where the term really comes from. Somebody who thinks they, who knows enough to think they know what's going on, but they don't yet really know what's going on. So, um, we don't want to say that confidence is equal to competence and concept mastery. Far from it. Um, we need an external check. Hence, the idea that there has to be something communal at the foundation of all of this. Now, this gives rise to certain problems. So, what about something that seems to be an inner episode of mine? How would you check it? Here's one classic example, pain. I say, I'm in pain. And it might be physical pain, or maybe it's emotional, right? I say, I'm really upset. How would you, as an outsider, as Smith to my Jones, <laughs> assess this? After all, you can't feel my pain. Right? The smiley face charts at the doctor's office. Ah, oh, all right, good. That's one way of having <laughs> this, right? How do you feel? Do you feel like, you know, this? Or do you feel like this? Or do you feel like this? <laughs> or do you feel like, wow? <laughs> uh, so there is that sort of thing. Um, or, you know, often they will say, okay, give me an indicator of your level of pain, like on a scale of 0 to 10, how much pain are you feeling? And interestingly, there is a fair amount of intersubjective agreement about that, even though I would think, I hope I don't know what a 10 pain would feel like. Yeah. Wouldn't, vary, like, wouldn't varying degrees of pain tolerance kind of affect that? Well, sure, it can affect that. Um, there was like a distinct value, like measurement for pain, right? And like, some, like, like someone can, someone can um, interpret it as like a, Three out of ten, whereas someone else would interpret it as like a six out of ten. Yes, there definitely can be. And so, if we're thinking about how Smith might agree um, or disagree, what is Smith? Let's say Smith is the nurse who's examining the patient Jones. Oh, go ahead. I, I don't think that's possible. I don't think that's real. What that that idea that someone might experience the same one pain as three out of ten, and another person would experience the same pain at 6 out of 10, because what does it mean to say that there is the same pain? I mean, that's just, that, that's just what you feel. So for instance, someone might stub their toe and have a very low pain tolerance and experience pain that's a 10 on the scale, whereas another person loses a hand and experiences very little pain because they have a very high pain tolerance. Yeah. You know, they're Spartan or something. <laughs> so I, I don't, there, there could be no measure that would say, Oh, you experience the same pain, and you're saying it's X 
and he's saying the same pain is Y, because there's no such thing as the same pain. All right, good. In a way, that's a very Wittgensteinian thought. I mean, there's no way for you as an observer to say, oh, well, wait, uh, yeah, let me grasp your pain and compare it to that person's pain and then to a pain I've had. And, you know, I, I can't get access to your inner episodes. Now, one way in which people do it is that they will do experiments where they, let's say, put somebody's hand in really ice-cold water and ask them to keep it there for a certain length of time and tell them how much pain they're feeling and then see how people compare on this. The idea is you're facing simil similar physical stimuli and to judge how people are responding to that stimulus. But indeed, that's that seems to be leaving out of something really important, right? It's like uh, stimulus and then your output will, of a number. What's missing from the chart is how much pain you're actually feeling, right? So it's hard to say whether you have the same internal feeling but a different scale um, or whether you've got a different internal feeling, etc. Um, but let's ask, and, and so that gets hard, I think. But let's ask for something much more fundamental. Suppose Smith is the nurse and Jones is the patient coming in to complain of pain, but Smith is a little suspicious that Jones is a hypochondriac and isn't really in pain. How does Smith figure out whether Jones is really in pain or not? Is Smith showing like less controllable symptoms like sweating or uh, like signs of shock or pacing or moaning? You know? Good, exactly. You look yeah. for these behavioral manifestations, right? If Jones walks in and says, hey, there's Ratchet, feeling lots of pain today, you know, <laughs> and starts joking around, you might be thinking, yeah, I don't believe that you're really paid, you know, it's a lot of pain today. On the other hand, if Jones comes in and says, oh, I, I just, oh, I feel terrible, oh, I, oh so much pain, and exhibit, exhibits these behavioral manifestations, then Smith is inclined to approve. Now, notice, Jones could be faking it. But on the other hand, there is something that serves as an external manifestation that allows for this kind of communal evaluation of whether Jones has actually grasped the concept of pain. Now, Kripke, by the way, this is a place where I think Kripke indicates some skepticism about the skeptical solution he's attributing to Wittgenstein. Because at one point he says, I'm, I think that if the claim is that all inner episodes have behavioral manifestations that allow for that kind of check, even that weak kind of check, that's probably empirically false. Think about what it is to have the inner episode associated with the sensation of this wall, okay, that is sort of gray, sort of green, <laughs> kind of ambiguous in color. What would be the behavioral manifestation of seeing that? Lower energy. Lower energy, <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, it does strike me that institutions tend to paint things colors that might look good in your dining room, but are actually sort of... And, and they always have fluorescent lighting, which sucks. We, yeah, that's right, exactly. No, in fact, lighting is terrible. It was so much better when I was younger. And it's not just that my eyes are getting worse, though they are. But there was a dramatic change when my wife switched over to the new light bulbs and refused to allow me to use incandescent bulbs. It used to be you turn on the light, and it was light. Why can't you use those bulbs? Like, why don't people use those anymore? I don't know, I stocked up on a bunch of them and used them in secret. <laughs> but, but, the re but, you know, I mean, now I turn on the light and it's like, oh, it's so dull, I can hardly see anything. And, well, never mind, this is a fight I've had with my wife for years. Um, it's not really a fight, it's more just like a complaint, okay? <laughs> Maybe that's another indication. Does Jones complain about the right kinds of things? Well, anyway, so... With, it's not clear at all that seeing something like this really has a determinate behavioral manifestation that would distinguish it from other things. After all, there are lots of it. Even if looking at this color does kind of lower your energy level, presumably lots of other colors might have the same behavioral effects. So there may not be a distinction. Now, if we think about one other issue. <clears throat> well, really, yeah, I guess there are two other things I should mention. One, just briefly, this is intimately connected with Wittgenstein's discussion of criteria. Presumably when Smith is evaluating Jones's mastery of the concept and what Jones means by something, there are certain external criteria, observable criteria, by which Smith determines that of Jones. Now notice here, this is not a behavioral presupposition of the argument. It's not that Wittgenstein is starting out as a behaviorist and then applying 
some behavioral understanding. Instead, what Wittgenstein is doing is saying, there must be such criteria in order for it to be possible for us to participate in this form of life. If there's something utterly uncheckable, if you're just saying, I'm in this internal state, and you guess what? There's no external manifestation. Maybe not even my saying I'm in that state. <laughs> um, then I, I don't know how to, you know, that, that doesn't really lead to any shared form of life. There have to be observable criteria for me to evaluate your mastery of the concept. Um, however, the key point that I want to get to at the end here is this idea of, you might say, a reversal. Um, Kripke puts it in terms of conditionals uh, and inverting conditionals. I think it would actually be better to talk about inverting causal statements or because statements, which do have a connection to conditionals, but are not exactly the same thing. It's a question of P <laughs> because Q, or Q because P. And so one way of seeing this sort of issue is in the Euthyphro problem, another point from Plato, where the question arises, uh, Euthyphro says, oh, well, you know, what is it for something to be right? It's for the gods to love it. And Socrates says, ah, are you saying that the gods love it because it's right, or that it's right because the gods love it? <laughs> Those are two different positions. Even if it's true that it is right if and only if the gods love it, and both of these positions would agree on that, which is really causally primary. And so he says, look, there are a lot of philosophical positions that end up amounting to these inversions. So he gives some examples on page 93 in a footnote. Here is William James's psychological theory. Okay, he says, the rational statement is that we feel sorry because we cry, not that we cry because we feel sorry. Common sense says, look, I'm crying because I'm feeling sad. And James says, no, you're not. You're feeling sad because you're crying. <laughs> um, I, you know, I ran away because I felt fear. No, you feel fear because you ran away. Um, yeah, I've always thought that's preposterous. Okay, but but you know, the idea would be no, your body is reacting a certain way, and it takes a while for consciousness to catch up. <laughs> um, anyway, one of you had a question or an objection? Yeah. Yeah. So, like, sometimes some I've noticed that something will happen, or, or someone will say, like, "Oh, this action is terrible," and maybe I disagree, and I'll say, "Why?" But I don't mean why is it terrible. I mean, really, how is it terrible? Like, like I can, I can, I ask the wrong question, and it's answered usually in the way in the in the correct way. Do you know what I'm saying? No. <laughs> but give okay, an example. So, okay, so like my cousin Chris smoked cigarettes. He went out after dinner, smoked cigarettes, and my mom said, my mom would say something like, "Oh, it's you know, it's terrible. He smokes." And say, why? Just say, you know, because it's immoral or something. What I, I don't mean why is it immoral. Whatever reason, I don't mean why is it that way. I mean, what makes it that way? Like, like how is it? Am I still not? Look, oh. I'll come up to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's the difference between how? So, I mean, suppose somebody says, oh, look, it's bad to smoke because it harms your health. Sure. How is that different? Is that a how or is that a why type of? Yeah. That's what I wonder. What, what, if I want to know how, why or how, if I want to know what qualities or what things are great making or bad making or or, or what, is it a why or how question? Like I, I often don't know how. Oh well, are it good? It could be either one in a sense, right? Because you could be providing the explanation, or you could be explaining the mechanism of this. Um, in in fact, in one way of reading what James is doing is saying we. Don't, it's not that we cry because we're sorry, we feel sorry because we cry. Um, right. He's saying there's a mechanism here, right? And the mechanism provides the explanation, but also explains how it is that we feel sad. We feel sad because of some physiological event that takes place in the right. body. That, yeah, that's right. So, so, right, I think in some cases one of those is going to seem more appealing. And in the moral case, if somebody says, yeah, what's wrong with that is another way of putting it, it tries to be neutral between the two. Somebody might say, Okay, here's why, in the sense of giving some, let's say the utilitarian says, because it doesn't maximize happiness. <laughs> and somebody else says, well, but you know, how is it that it fails to maximize happiness? Oh, well, because you know, it increases somebody's probabilities of getting cancer. And 
that would be more a mechanism how to respond. Right. Um, and you're right, that often these things get mixed together. So what are some other examples of this? Here's one. Uh, we don't condemn certain acts because they're immoral. They're immoral because we condemn them. In other words, they're just these conventions we have, and when you contravene the conventions, we say it's immoral. Or fire and heat aren't constantly conjoined because fire causes heat. Fire causes heat because they're constantly conjoined. That's sort of a way of stating the Humean position. Or the Wittgensteinian position, we don't say 7 plus 12 is 19 because we grasp the concept of addition. We say we grasp the concept of addition because we say things like 12 plus 7 is 19. And so it's this sort of reversal of the normal common sense order. And Kripke says, I'm suspicious of philosophical positions of the types illustrated by these slogans, whether or not they're so proof to put. So he is attributing this to Wittgenstein, but he's clearly not endorsing that kind of reversal. But he sees this as Wittgenstein's strategy. So what is it to mean plus by that plus sign? Well, it's really, in the end, for us to agree that you mean that by it. And by virtue of what do we agree, you give the kinds of answers we're inclined to give when faced with those problems. And that's all there is to it. Well, next time we're going to look at objections to the skeptical solution and see what other possibilities there are.